take one. You're zooming in, bud. I'm getting electrocuted. These go to 11. Welcome to another episode of... Shut up about a Sasquatch. ...the eyes of his camera. The girls are, are so sweet and cute, just like cats. <laughs> I'm scared to close my eyes. People are going to want to know how it all went down. Hi, I'm Hound. And you can't talk about found footage without talking about... Yes! You also can't talk about found footage without mentioning... Yeah, it probably was illegal in Kentucky, you know, the 12 states. And of course, you can't talk about found footage without talking about... Watch it, Alan, I'm shooting. ...that one. So you see the predicament that I'm in here. In the history of found footage, both as a genre and a format, there are just so many big names that always come up every time you try to discuss it, let alone that the majority of people who are not familiar with it will envision some of the worst that it has to offer, which leads to a lot of dismissive attitudes towards the genre as well as the format. Despite this, found footage actually has a lot to offer, not only to horror, but the film world as well as all storytelling mediums that exist. And that's what I want to go over with you today. The history, the many faces of, and the impact that found footage has had and continues to have. First, I'd like to define found footage for you. Now, you might think that in order for a film to be called found footage that it would need to be found, which is wording that invokes a person or group of people that are recording something that end up disappearing, leaving behind the videos for some other person to edit for little to no pay, much like real movies. You would be somewhat correct. There are a substantial amount of films that fit neatly into that definition. But in my opinion, it harshly narrows down the choices to a very specific type of found footage film, leaving out some of the best that the format has to offer. Instead, I like to use a broader definition that welcomes some of the more loose ones to slip in the door. Found footage to me is a film that utilizes in at least a considerable portion diegetic recordings from an in-universe character, meaning that a good chunk of the film is footage from a camera that a character that exists within the universe is recording with or viewing. It's a bit much. When using this definition, there are generally three major styles of found footage. The first is one we've already covered. Generally, a horror film, it follows a group of characters, one of which is recording everything that's going on when things, well, shit gets real, eventually leading to the camera or its contents being left behind or lost, only to be found at a later date and cut together by the unpaid intern. Next is the faux documentary style. It's pretty self-explanatory. Not always a horror film, this style of found footage seeks to capitalize on the believability of the documentary style, either recreating the interview sections akin to cold case files or something more along the lines of field documentaries that document people or things with a non-disruptive, fly-on-the-wall style of cinematography. Popular films from this style are This is Spinal Tap, What We Do in the Shadows, and Man Bites a Dog. Last is a relatively new style of found footage, or at least one that has only recently saw mass usage. I personally call them screeners. They deploy the use of surveillance cameras as well as computer or phone screens, watching people go about their day-to-day -day lives until something resembling a plot happens and things get maybe interesting. Centering around severe invasion of privacy, these films are typically edited together by board NSA agents on the clock. Examples of these films include Look, Searching, Unfriended, and the recent Host. Now that we've covered a broader definition as well as the three main styles, let's go over the tellings of found footage. Even though there is a lot of differences between the styles, there are things that are commonplace among all found footage. Due to the format's aim of trying to achieve maximum believability, you won't have the polish that you're used to seeing in big budget studio productions. You're pretty much guaranteed to have shaky cam of various degrees. There will be either minimalistic sound design or they'll opt to go with completely diegetic sounds. Natural lighting is very common since it can be excused by the format itself. And last but not least, you'll notice a lot of mistakes. All things that would keep a normal filmmaker awake at night suddenly completely fine and actually heightens the realism of the film. Huh, ain't that a concept? Now, just because the majority of found footage films in the public conscious are horror films, or at the very least horror adjacent, doesn't mean that they're all horror films. There's actually a wide variety of different genres and subgenres of found footage. Of course, you do have your typical horror films, usually gravitating towards urban legends like Blair Witch and Neroy the Curse, or creature features like Bigfoot with Exists, 
or trolls with Troll Hunter. Along with these, you have your thrillers that play out with less horror and more drama, like The Dirties and The Sacrament. Of course, you can't forget good old faux snuff films like Guinea Pig or August Underground, but there's also comedy, usually in the mockumentary style, like what we do in The Shadows and Behind the Mask, The Rise of Leslie Vernon. There's even action films like Chronicle. And of course you have dramas like Language Lessons, Punishment Park, and Zero Day. All of these films use the found footage format to increase the believability of the story they are telling, grounding the recording within the character's world. Along with these genres, there's also a bunch of themes that are prevalent throughout found footage. Desensitization and dehumanizing of news media over time, the role that the viewer of a heinous act plays in said heinous act, a disconnect from reality via viewing the world through a lens, narcissism and character studies in the form of someone documenting their life, commonly found in some of these horror ones are government cover-ups, and there's even some political commentary here and there. Although on the surface found footage may appear to be very one note, it's actually a very diverse and thought-provoking genre or medium for film. So I'm, I'm ready. You ready? So now that we've defined found footage, set up the styles, gone over the tellings, and discuss the genres and themes, where did all of this begin? Due to the low barrier of entry with found footage films, it is impossible to know just how many actually exist. Combine that with how many non-major budget or influential films are now considered lost media, and it's a pretty big shitstorm trying to find a definitive answer as to what the real first found footage film was. But that's film. Can we go back further? As it turns out, we can all the way back to the 1400s with epistolary novels. During this time, there was an emerging form of writing that included letters in the novels, which led to more letters and less novel, eventually leading to books solely comprised of letters, like Prison of Love by Diego de San Pedro and Love Letters Between a Nobleman and His Sister. A different time, I guess. By an anonymous writer. Smart move. What's funny is that eventually people grew tired of the epistolary format and started parodying it and running it into the ground. Time really is a flat circle, huh? Despite the public's shift of favor, epistolary novels were still being made, the format being used by writers like Marquis de Sade, Jane Austen, and Fyodor Dostoevsky, leading, funnily enough, to some of the best books out there. Notably, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, using epistolary format occasionally in the form of letters, and Bram Stoker's Dracula being completely epistolary, showing that adding realism to horror through the aspect of real-life documentation has been a long-standing tradition in storytelling. Fast forward a bit, and we have film. And from the very moment the film camera was invented, it was used to document by the Lumiere brothers. Trains, workers, life. That is, until the very first cut, which would lead cinema down the path of theatrics, eventually even using varying camera angles, distancing itself even more from the previous stage play like in realistic viewing position. Now filmmakers had a plethora of tools to use to construct a narrative and tell their increasingly visual story, growing further and further away from the documentation of life as lived. Conversely to the ever-growing magic of filmmaking, found footage is a type of medium in which it wants to heighten the believability of a subject by taking away the polish of what we now know as traditional filmmaking. Put it like this, you watch a documentary and you don't question whether or not they're lying to you because it's a documentary, it's real. Meanwhile, you watch a film and you know it's not real. There's a god camera and tons of edits and sometimes unrealistic things happen. Even the first actual documentary as we've come to know it, Nanook of the North, was in part a faux documentary, possibly making this the oldest found footage film by my non-Webster recognized definition. His name wasn't even Nanook. The wife wasn't his actual wife. Not Nanook also hunted with a gun, but the director wanted a more old school look to his way of life, so he made him use a harpoon. The director even lied about Not Nanook dying soon after filming due to starvation. It's rather fitting that, in the context of found footage, the first documentary film is an ethnographic film that lied about its main characters and played up their primitiveness, and the Isaac on the cake being the director leading people to believe the actor had passed away. Yeah. Move forward through time and we see the invention of something called cinema verite. Truthful cinema, also called observational cinema, a descriptive term coined in 1960 by a writer to describe the work of Giga Vertov, along with his brother and wife in a collection of 23 new newsreels they filmed from 1922 to 1925 called Kino Pravda, film Truth, documenting as truthfully as possible the newly Soviet Russia, which would inspire many filmmakers like Edgar Morin and John Roche, who led the Cinema Verite movement. The contributors to Cinema Verite wanted the filmmaker and the camera to be obvious to the viewer. 
This seems counterintuitive to most people, but which is more believable? We cut to a scene of someone washing their hands, paying no mind to the camera, and they walk off screen. Or we cut to someone sitting a camera down, washing their hands while talking to and addressing the camera as if it were a person. Which of these was the true scene? Which of these was truthful cinema? There are many movements like this that reject the polish and prestige of the time for a more rugged hands-on guerrilla approach to filmmaking that focused not on the lighting or the set design or big name actors or the continuity editing of the time, focusing instead on performance and the story being told. Movements like no wave cinema that featured lots of improv next to no rehearsing and the purposeful leaving in of accidents. My nightmare. Throwing away any kind of normalcy people had come to expect from films in favor of a raw and oftentimes hectic production as a statement against the polish that had come to be the status quo with art at the time. French New Wave, which sought to directly subvert the norm of cinematography and editing to make the viewer acutely aware of the existence of the camera and specifically the editing being done to the truth that the camera's lens had witnessed. Then there's Dogma 95, a film movement by Lars von Trier and Thomas Winterberg, which prioritized the storytelling and acting of a film while getting rid of crutches like fancy technology and effects. A movement that spawned many great films and by many names is still alive today. In the modern day, we can't forget the not movement movement of mumblecore that emphasized realistic conversations and raw acting instead of grand overarching plots or visuals. All of these movements specifically aimed themselves against the mainstream, rejecting what had become commonplace in favor of putting filmmaking in the hands of filmmakers, and above all, telling stories. All of this to say, the idea to enrich a story and make it more believable by tearing down the fourth wall and speaking directly to the audience in one way or another has long been a thing in filmmaking, as well as storytelling in general. Found footage, in a way, was inevitable, and it has a much more vibrant history than one would expect. Now, speaking of putting filmmaking in the hands of filmmakers, let's take a quick detour to discuss film versus digital as well as budget. Found footage style films from this time were heavily limited by their format and their budget. They're linked, but let's go over format first. Film requires expertise, expense for buying the film, as well as hefty post-production costs to transfer for editing as well as for printing. As digital became more commonplace with the release of home DV cameras, this allowed for a very little knowledge required to shoot a film as well as a much more narrow and less expensive post-production process. All you needed when it came to digital was an SD card and a decent computer. Now, let's take a quick look at budget. Low budget in the film world means $100,000 to $2 million, give or take. I'll repeat. Low budget in the film world means roughly $100,000 to $2 million. Now, micro budget is what we are looking for. This can mean $40 or $40,000. Popular micro budgets are El Mariachi made for the equivalent of $7,000 with the help of Robert Rodriguez's connections and his friends. And also never taking a second take because film is expensive. Clerks was made for $27,575 reportedly by maxing out credit cards. Another micro budget film is David Lynch's Eraserhead made for a budget of $10,000 over the course of six years. Do you see a pattern yet? So you give these filmmakers with a burning passion, a cheap camera, an easy post-production process, and a format that benefits from their imperfect lighting and scratchy audio, and what happens? You get found footage, for better or for worse. Found footage is a sort of black sheep of cinema. Overpopulated by trash, you have to dig for a while to find a still pretty shitty cubic zircona. This is due to that ever so appealing, incredibly low barrier of entry. Once handheld cameras were in the holding hands of wannabe creatives, the sky became the limit. Everyone from your local film school nerd, me, and your local drug addict, also me, were able to direct and shoot films, and at a much faster rate than their Hollywood counterparts. An important distinction to make, I think, is one between independent low-budget films and found footage films, both being made for micro levels of budget by generally independent filmmakers, but the difference is that for a time, the equipment available to them was of a drastically lower quality than the movie-going public had become accustomed to. Therefore, found footage had the upper hand. People wouldn't expect college kids trekking the woods would bring along a 35mm camera with 15 lights and a bunch of lavs and booms. They'd bring their dad's camcorder and some granola bars. And when movies like 28 Days Later came out that had scenes that were shot on these relatively inexpensive handhelds, it showed that the visual fidelity was not as big of an issue in the grand scheme of things. That just because you don't have the latest Ari camera or Zeiss lenses that you can tell a story. 
But that's the thing. You can tell a story, any story. And when you can tell any story, there's going to be a lot of bad ones. Where bigger budget films have multiple barriers and hurdles that, in a way, act as a filter for weeding out the bad stories or the less skilled or prepared of filmmakers, found footage did not have those filters. It's definitely a hindrance, but part of the appeal of found footage, at least for me, is that it was a format that allowed anyone to tell a story while being taken seriously. From the Hollywood writer who has sold several scripts that are collecting dust in some executive's backlogs, to Joe Schmo from fucking Iowa who just felt like telling a story about his dog. It broke down the barrier that kept the people's voices from being heard for so long. And it just so happened to break into the mainstream. Well, we're not quite there yet. Normally when you bring up found footage, the pretentious among you will jump at the opportunity to flex their knowledge and decry that Blair Witch wasn't the first found footage film, it was actually the last broadcast. Or if they're not worried about people's perception of them, they'd mention Cannibal Holocaust. I want to roll back a bit and discuss one of the first times we've direct acknowledgement of an in-universe camera in a narrative film, that being Peeping Tom from 1960. The film is about a serial killer who records his victim's last moments and it shows what he's recording as he's doing it. This sort of POV shot would later be used in Black Christmas and then became a permanent staple in slasher flicks, showing the killer's POV from the tree line to heighten tension, letting you know that he's out there. But the first surviving film that is pretty unanimously classified as found footage is The Connection from 1961. The film is of a director and his camera guy trying to get a slice of life documentation of a strung out group of flatmates as they muse about life and wait for their next hit. A very proto boys in the band type feel, which funnily enough, they share the same cinematographer. This is a very good example of the fly on the wall documentary style that I discussed earlier. Fast forward quite a bit to 1972 and we have The Legend of Boggy Creek, a faux documentary about a Bigfoot character that ties in real interviews with the locals. Being the first mockumentary people generally point to, this film would lay the groundwork for a lot of big players in the found footage genre. Next up is The One, Cannibal Fucking Holocaust from 1980. There is so much to talk about with this film, but I don't want to spend too much time on it for obvious reasons. Bigger fish to fry. The film isn't entirely found footage, instead deciding to use the format to depict what happened to a group of filmmakers as they go to document prim primitive life in the Amazon. When things go awry, well, they run into cannibals. Eh, cannibals who specifically don't take kindly to fucking assholes destroying their village. Who would have thunk it? Effective use of the format to ground us in the crew's shoes, as well as a nice theme discussing the desensitization of news over time. It's just a shame that all people can remember about the film is that it depicts real violence towards animals. I guess you guys forgot about Friday the 13th. Now, skipping along to a lighter beat, and we have This Is Spinal Tap, a mockumentary about a new wave of British heavy metal band comprised of idiots, more so than usual. Featuring fun songs and a lot of humor, it's an easy recommend to a lot of people. It basically copies the formula for documentaries on bands while they're on tour, showing off gear, hard-hitting questions about their previous members, all spliced between the band's performances, showing that the found footage style can be used for an effective comedy approach, and not just horror. In 1985, we're introduced to the first of the gross-out found footage films, the Guinea Pig series comes out blasting with Guinea Pig 1 and 2 releasing the same year. The first one being a sort of fake snuff film that just tries to make you wince with a couple good VFX shots here and there. The second one reads more like your grandpa's weird art installation and was ultimately way more enjoyable because the dude is just a straight up character. Although these look tame compared to some of the shit we've seen by now, they're still a part of found footage as well as film history. 84 Charlie Mopic released in 1989 is a found footage film focused on single unit during the Vietnam War, as they're being documented by their cameraman. Told entirely from a single camera's and cameraman's perspective, the film follows a diverse and complex group of characters as we see their journey unfold. Still feeling a bit excessive, for lack of a better word, it seems to show at least a more nuanced image of the war than most of what was being pushed at the time, and even some decades later. The found footage aspect is used properly to ground you with the unit as well as keep the budget down. The McPherson tape, also known as UFO Abduction, was also released in 1989. Made for $6,500, this film is probably the biggest precursor to what we now know as found footage. It was recorded on digital and distributed by way of word of mouth as well as tapes passing hands. Since this was 10 years before Blair Witch, people, notably people inclined to think aliens are real, didn't even think twice before declaring this a real tape. The director didn't lead on that it was fake in any way, no title cards, no credits, and he didn't even have a hand in most of the film's reach. 
So it's funny to see all these people back in 1989 saying this cheap ass video that a kid fresh out of college filmed with his friends and family is a real tape of an alien abduction. A few years later in 1992, we'd get one of the better hoaxes in found footage. BBC One would air a segment that comprised of them investigating a supposed haunted house. They recorded it beforehand, but played it off as if it was a live broadcast. What starts out as a cringy but still fun show, I guess, turns into a horror film by the end. Funny. Also in 1992, we get a foreign found footage film called Man Bites Dog. A documentary crew somehow came into contact with an infamous serial killer who is still active, and they decide to make him their subject. It goes about as well as you'd think it would, a very nice character study drama as opposed to full frontal assault horror film that utilizes the found footage format as well as the unreliable narrator very effectively. And now, finally, on to the last broadcast. Generally, there's a lot of contention between people when it comes to this film and Blair Witch, mainly people declaring that Blair Witch stole last broadcast thunder, and I'll quickly dispel that. Blair Witch started as an idea in 1993, began production in 1996, and then was filmed in October of 1997. Meanwhile, the last broadcast first premiere was in March of 1998. Now onto the film. Production-wise, there's a few important things here. Made for supposedly under a $1,000 budget, they saved money by using non-actors, using equipment that they had already owned, trading for equipment they didn't have, filmed almost entirely on digital, and then edited completely on widely available editing software. Basically, what is now the independent standard for making films. The film itself is a little disjointed to say the least, incorporating found footage, TV interviews, a TV show, field recording and field interviews, and even some third person camera at the end. Just throw it all in there, I guess. The story is similarly disjointed. Looking at it on paper, it could have ended up a lot worse than it actually did. So kudos for that. Ultimately, the film wasn't that well received, leaving it to only really be known by horror aficionados and even then, those of us with an interest in found footage. Looking at it stacked up next to the found footage library, it's not bad. One thing it does well is the story is geared properly toward its own medium, making it not only more credible, but believable. I've seen some shit, man, for what is technically referred to as the first found footage film as we know it. It was a hell of a way to start, but it was a pebble gently skipping across a serene pond compared to the behemoth that was around the corner. Okay, I got you. This is my home. Okay. Which I am leaving the comforts of for the weekend to explore the Blair Witch. Have you ever heard of the Blair Witch? And they say that the, the woods are all haunted up there. It's not true. Anybody worth their salt around here knows that this area has been haunted. Oh, for years. that's bullshit. Very good true. day. You They're happy with the way well the documentary's documentary. going? Yes, I am. So you heard noises last night? We like shortcuts, don't we? Yeah, all I'm saying is that you got us lost, man. I'm making a documentary about a witch, not about us getting lost. Doesn't hurt, because we'll all look back on this and laugh heartily. I gave you back the map, I Heather. I gave you the map. I gave you back the map. Someone's going to be looking for us. Fuck! Oh, God! Ew! What the fuck is that? I'm going to die out of here. Starting out as a little idea in 1993, two independent filmmakers from Florida flourished it into a six year long journey that they had no guarantee would even work, let alone pay off. Inspired by films like Legend of Boggy Creek and TV shows like In Search Of that dealt with paranormal subjects but grounded in reality with the use of their documentary styles, Sanchez and Mirak wrote a less than 40 page screenplay for their idea, planning that most of the dialogue would be improvised on the spot by the actors. In the story, we follow the documentary filmmaker Heather and her two assistants, cameraman Josh and the sound guy, Mike. As they venture into the small town of Burkittsville, where there exists the urban legend of the Blair Witch. After interviewing the locals, they trek into the woods to visit landmarks in the story so that Heather can have a more cinematic narration as well as good B-roll to use in her documentary. When things go a bit south, after Josh knocks over some rocks, I think. You didn't just knock that over. Please tell me you didn't just knock that over. Is that what starts all this? 
They get lost, lose the map, start infighting, all the while more and more creepy shit keeps happening to them, leading to paranoia and hysteria among the group. With script in hand and after finding their actors, they began the filming process, heading to Burkittsville in October of 1997. They acquired a CP16 film camera used for the cinematic interview shots, as well as Heather's narration segments, and a Hi8 camcorder used for everything else. They even hired Josh for the role because he actually knew how to use a camera to an extent. They were given walkie-talkies in case of emergency, a GPS locator to ensure they wouldn't actually go missing, and were essentially kicked into the woods to do all the dirty work while the directors chilled. Every day the directors would go back into the woods, leaving them a milk crate full of food and water, as well as notes and direction for the actors. This is kind of where the heightened realism side of found footage kind of rears its head. Every day the directors gave them less food in order to make them more agitated and their performances more realistic. Say what you want about manipulating your actors, but apparently it works. No, I'm not fucking scared. I'm just tired. I'm hungry. I'm fucking like, I'm just fucking done, man. That's not the character talking. Along these lines, the directors told the actors that there would be stuff happening at night. Didn't tell them what it was or when it would happen. But every night, the directors would go do things to scare the actors, throwing rocks, snapping twigs, even playing a recording of crying kids throughout the woods. But there's one that sticks out to me. On one of the final nights, the directors dressed up a crew member that was running alongside them. Due to difficulties with the camera, on the only usable take, Josh didn't turn the camera far enough to capture what was chasing them. This legitimate accident turned out to be a godsend. This would have been the only shot in the final film after all of the editing down to actually show the entity that was pursuing them. Now meaning that we never see what the characters saw or have any solid idea of what's really going on. Could this all be in their heads? Who the fuck knows? So they wrapped shooting, got the actors some food at Denny's, and then began the treacherous journey that is editing. After, of course, returning the cameras and getting their money back. Editing was by far the most time intensive part of the process. Over eight months, Mirik and Sejas took almost 19 hours worth of footage and narrowed it down to eventually one hour and 20 minutes. The film has tons of errors, shots that are out of focus, people stumbling over their dialogue. We can even get more technical and talk about lighting being off, framing being atrocious, sound levels peaking all the time. But guess what? It's found footage. Therefore, all of these little mistakes actually help the film. So fast forward a bit, and here we are, summer of 1999. People are lining up at the theater, all the talk shows are buzzing, everyone in some way or another is talking about this film. How did a little independent film made for less than $60,000 get here? Welcome to the internet. The directors of the film decided to go the route of guerrilla advertising. They generated interest in their film by creating a website teasing it. But they did one thing just a little different, a little unusual. They didn't mention that their film was a film. In all of the advertising for the Blair Witch Project, it was described only as found footage. The website itself had been completely immersed in the world of Blair Witch. They really wanted you to think this was real. And it worked. At least insofar as treating the film as real got it to spread by word of mouth and interest. There certainly were a number of people who walked into theaters believing it to be a snuff film, but they were not the majority. So on July 14th, 1999, why wasn't this released in October? The moving going masses were introduced to what would be henceforth referred to as found footage. And how was it received? Well, some people walked away thinking it was real, some even leaving the theater halfway unable to take it. Some people thought it was fake as hell, some thought it was a decent film by its own merits, and some puked from the shaky cam giving them severe motion sickness. Overall, surprisingly, critical response to the film was positive. They loved the use of found footage to engross the audience in a narrative, and believed that at the end of the day, the film delivered on dread and terror with good performances from the leads. How is audience reception currently? Ugh, like nothing even happens, man. Yeah, much like The Exorcist going back a multitude of years to a film that made such a lasting impact on the genre at a specific point in time, doesn't always yield good results. Our expectations are much higher, much more experienced, and when a film is hyped up like this one, it's hard to meet those expectations. I have a hard time recommending this film to people because I know nowadays no one has the patience to sit through a film where yeah, basically nothing happens. They want action, a big scary CG ghost face courtesy of Andrew Kramer, and gore galore. Blair Witch contains none of those things, but you can't deny the effect that Blair Witch has had. Without cheap gimmicks found so commonplace in horror media today, it told a story in a unique way that made such a profound impact on the horror genre, for the better and for the worse. So. Now that there's been a found footage film that's broken box office records and taken the world by storm, what happens next? Well, truth be told, not a whole lot. 
I can imagine people seeing Blair Witch as a lightning in a bottle, one-off, non-recreatable fluke. In a way, they were right. But that didn't stop found footage from still being made. In 2003, the film The Last Horror Movie would be released, what is essentially an English language version of Man Bites Dog from 1993, that heightens the unpredictability of the main character and is, as far as I remember, an enjoyable watch. The American faux snuff scene got started here with the release of August Under Underground's first two entries in 2001 and 2003. Also in 2003, we got a less horror but more dramatic found footage film called Zero Day, based on, well, Columbine. If anything from the time was going to show the capabilities of the found footage format, this would be where I'd put my money. What is possibly the first of the screener subcategory of films comes out in 2007 with the film Look, told completely from the perspective of CCTV surveillance cameras. Cloverfield came out using found footage to put us in the perspective of a group of people panicking amidst a kaiju invasion of New York, a premise that would be perfected in the cinematography of Gareth Edwards' 2014 film Godzilla. George Romero even took a hearty stab at the format with his film Diary of the Dead, stating that he had always wondered about doing a emerging media type of film, liking the ability to use a small crew and on a relatively small budget. The Spanish found footage film Wreck came out during this time, and we even get our first couple of indie darlings in the genre with the Poughkeepsie Tapes and Lake Mungo, as well as Japan giving it a go with Neroi the Curse, which also has similar cult status. Audiences at this time were definitely mixed. When I was a kid, I remembered everyone going crazy for the torture porn genre of horror and not really talking about found footage. Saw, Hostel, Human Centipede. Those were the ones in the general talks that I was around, but I was like 12. So not the most esteemed of horror conversations. If I mentioned a film like Wreck, no one would know what the fuck I was talking about. Found footage wasn't quite fully mainstream just yet. During this time, there definitely were films being made solely to capitalize on the craze left behind by Blair Witch. But it feels more like a lot of lower budget productions and ideas were getting the green light because of it. That doesn't mean they're all good though. For every decent to good flick, there's two or three terrible ones. A very generous ratio considering the future of the genre, but we're not quite there yet. Producers weren't fully on board with the found footage gimmick. That is to say, throwing money at any and all projects in order to make a return on investment on each of them with the hopes that one of the 20 films they just produced strikes black gold. At this time, it seemed that Blair Witch was a once in a lifetime story. A renegade crew of filmmakers set out with less than $100,000, much lower than even the lowest budget Hollywood films, and make an overall average movie, but due to the gimmick appeal combined with the diehard nature of horror fans, results in a gross far outweighing the scraps that it costs to make. After all, lightning doesn't strike twice, does it? Capturing whatever paranormal phenomena is occurring or is not occurring. Good thing you're here. You believe me, right? Yeah, of course. Oh, that's so awesome. See, this is why it scares me, is because you don't take it seriously. Hey, we haven't had anything interesting happen in a while. You scared? Oh. So you don't remember any of this? Um. It's not the house. It's me. I'm taking care of this. Nobody comes to my house, fucks with my girlfriend. In comes Orrin Pelly, heavily inspired by the Blair Witch Project and wanting to turn away from the gore craze of the mid-2000s. Pelly decided to scrounge together what he could, combine it with what he had, and get out there and make a movie. He got a Sony camcorder, no lighting kit, a tripod, and what script he did write was bare bones, intending to be supplemented with lots and lots of improvising by the actors. So, quick rundown of the story. Katie is having recurring non-supervised visitations from her childhood demon, and her boyfriend, day trader, and paranormal skeptic, Mika, decides the best course of action is to buy a $3,000 camera and record her sleeping with it. Not the worst idea. Initially, things start out small, keys being moved, demon heading to the kitchen for a midnight snack, and so on. But they build, gradually getting more and more intense over the course of the film. Filming would take place in Pelly's home in 2006. Occasionally, another actor will make an appearance, but it will mostly be Katie and Mika. Mika, like Josh, 
acted as the director of photography on set, bringing with him experience as a camera operator from college. Petley did the editing himself, where very minimal VFX work was needed, mostly split screen hiding and basic compositing. Despite filming taking one week, the post-production process took a year, with Pelly still working on the editing when the film was being sent out to festivals. The year is 2006. We're at Screamfest, where director Orrin Pelly's independent horror film that he shot in his own house over the course of seven days for an estimated $15,000 has been accepted and will be premiering to its first audience. The movie had some buzz around it, but all that mattered was it impressed one person, and that person sent screeners of the film to as many people he could find, one of which was a then senior executive at Miramax, Jason Blum. And the rest was history. A two year long post production and producer wrangle fest later, and in September of 2009, the film is finally getting released to theaters. A few theaters. 12, to be exact. Well, 11 of those were sold out. The budget was set to be made back and earn Paramount a modest return on investment. Everyone claps and congratulates each other on a small but delightful success at the box office before moving on to their next ventures. Until Orrin Pelly went online to urge fans to demand that the film be played at their theaters. This was the marketing that I remembered most from Paranormal Activity. Not at all faked, spy cam footage of people reacting to the film and some text talking about how it's the scariest film of the year and that you need to call your local theater to demand that it be played there. Well, even as a kid, I thought this was a weird tactic, but turns out it paid off. Over 1 million people demanded. And by November of 2009, Paranormal Activity was playing in theaters worldwide. So, how was the film anyways? Critic reviews seem to be relatively positive. Fucking Roger Ebert gave it 3.5 out of 4 stars. Roger Ebert. The guy who would call you everything short of a slur for liking slasher flicks. After you've sat through hour after hour of this complete trash, these films hate women. The audiences that go to them who are identifying not with the victim, with the killer, who are cheering these killers on, don't seem to like women too much either. That Roger Ebert. The positive reviews tend towards congratulating the film on its use of silence and the fear of the unknown to its benefits on such a small budget. Meanwhile, detractors seem to be hammering down on the overuse of cliches and the film's lack of character. The first negative review on IMDb states, you'll love it if Blair Witch was too complicated to wrap your head around. If I remember correctly, the state of horror at the time was the Saw series coming out every fall, of which we were on number six in the year 2009. Final Destination on its fourth outing, Friday the 13th reboot came out and the whole reboot plague was beginning to pick up with Rob Zombie's Halloween films, the J-horror remakes, and even Spanish found footage film Wreck getting its English counterpart. Of course, you can look back at these years and see clear-cut gems and masterpieces, but I don't really remember things like Trick or Treat or Martyrs or The House of the Devil being in the public conscious. It was just those of us who were in the know and ingrained in horror that even knew of these films. Instead, the mainstream audience for horror were viewing films like The Mist, The Strangers, and Haunting in Connecticut. I think the general horror audience was craving a bit of toned down believability, to be honest. At a time when everything was seemingly trying to be as gory as possible and jam packed with blood and guts, here comes a film that doesn't even have any blood in it yet it still brings atmosphere that, at least on the first watch, was better than its peers. The film couldn't have come out at a better time, really, even given the two-year delay. Paranormal Activity. It comes out finally, goes viral online thanks to the seemingly spontaneous marketing scheme, and on top of that has critics singing its praises for effective low-budget filmmaking. All of that's fine and dandy, but what do studio execs really care about? At the end of Paranormal Activity's theater runs, it had made $193.4 million at the box office. That is not including its DVD or TV sales, on a total budget of $15,000, with post-production costs being more along the lines of $215,000. Let's do the math on that real quick. Eight hundred ninety-seven percent, almost a one thousand percent return on investment. So, Blair Witch, lightning in a bottle, freak accident never happening again. Happens again. Maybe there's something to this. All of a sudden, these found footage products get massive green lights. Why, dear prey, would a studio pay tens of millions of dollars for a production that might earn its budget back if they could instead spend one million on 10 productions with a guaranteed return on investment? Thus, we enter the dark times. Well, to call it the dark times wouldn't be completely true. Out of the hundreds of found footage films to come out from 2009 to 2015, 
there are a few good ones that I'd like to mention. Troll Hunter was awesome because it combined folklore with found footage, had effective use of CGI, interesting characters, and had the news station documentary style plot pushing the narrative forward for it. The Dirties was awesome because it forewent horror and stuck to just the drama. Two high school kids who are bullied decide to make their student film about them getting revenge on their classmates, except one kid takes it too seriously. One of the better uses of found footage, in my opinion. Creep was awesome because it went back to that two dudes in a camera feel, heightened by the excellent acting of Mark Duplass. A guy answers a Craigslist ad to record a video for a stranger when that stranger turns out to be a complete and total psychopathic serial killer. What more do you need? And What We Do in the Shadows was awesome because it's a mockumentary that takes the piss out of itself. A unique perspective of a camera crew documenting what life is like for a flat of vampires. Again, another effective use of found footage. It doesn't stick to horror and instead takes a comedic path that makes it stick out head and shoulders among the crowd. You'll notice that in this period, the true good found footage films are the ones that are either horror adjacent or ones that disregard horror entirely. Well, there's a reason for this. After the release of Paranormal Activity in 2009, executives saw just how much money there was to be made by capitalizing on the gimmick of found footage. You take a weak unfinished script, shoot it quick and dirty, throw in some CG ghost faces, and rush it out around October. If it doesn't do well at the box office, you sell it to a streaming platform and make TV licensing deals that earn your money back and then some. Generally produced for pennies compared to the norm, therefore as long as it makes any money back, then it's a success. That's the name of the game. Interest plus built-in audience plus the probability for a giant success equals throw everything at the wall and see what sticks. So found footage by now is in the public conscious. Horror has been long known as the genre for built-in audiences, and Paranormal Activity proved that you can strike gold in the medium. Everyone wants to have their own Paranormal Activity. Everyone. Both Hollywood and indie filmmakers start churning out dozens and dozens of found footage cash grabs every year, bombarding your red box with heaps of shit every October. Want to rent Trick or Treat or Aliens for Halloween? Have fun scrolling through eight pages of the Phoenix Incident. So, how did audiences respond to all of this? <sighs> this is gonna be like therapy. Well. There's only so many times you can be told that a film is based on a true story before it gets old and tiring, and eventually it becomes a trigger. You pop in a movie possibly not even related to found footage, I mean, come on, the shit was everywhere. And up comes a screen telling you that it's based on real events. You hop up at your fucking lazy boy and you take a sledgehammer to the DVD player. I don't care if it was actually based on a true story or not, as soon as I see those words I start seeing red. And that's just the tip of the iceberg, that's usually the first five seconds of a film. There's only so many ways you can make a found footage film. The creatives were very few and far between. So nine out of 10 times the film you see are almost exact carbon copies of each other. A group of people, including one person with a neurotic need to film everything, go to do something, then something goes wrong. And instead of getting the fuck out of Dodge, they decide to stay and film it. Sure, it can work, I guess, but the reasonings are usually very shallow. And when they happen, you know it's the writer or director just saying, see, they have a reason to be filming. You can't critique my film. Speaking of motivation, it's found footage, which means everyone dies, because you can't have found footage with survivors in most cases, right? So if everyone dies, then why spend the time making likable characters? Make everyone an insufferable prick. By the end of the film, you're rooting for the villain. You want them to die. Speaking of the antagonist, most of these films used ghosts, which meant no on-screen presence. Sure, it worked for Blair Witch, but imagine seeing 20 films in a row that have nothing happen. Only thing worse than that is how many times the Andrew Kramer ghost face popped up. And then the ones that did have stuff on screen, it was a 50-50 fucking coin toss of either a Party City gorilla costume pretending to be Bigfoot, or your nephew's Windows 98 CGI work that he did between school and basketball practice. This shit was maddening. As a kid that was very interested in found footage, I saw so many terrible films. I could have been watching classics, checking out new directors, delving into foreign films, but no, I gave so much of my time to found footage, and thanks to this era dominating the library, the majority of what I saw was trash. The worst sin a film can commit, besides being boring of course, is a total disregard and lack of empathy for the audience. And that's what a lot of these films felt like. Looking back, it all feels cookie cutter. They took a proven formula and just mass produced it. So many films with unlikable characters spewing some of the worst dialogue you've ever heard, running around in forests or haunted houses, small glimpses of something coming after them, purposefully bad camera work, cliched glitchy camera editing, and then when it ends, it's like a slap to the face. What was the purpose? What story did you tell? What was it all for? Filmmaking is supposed to be about telling a story, moving your audience to experience the grand emotions of life. 
leaving a lasting impact that changes a part of them. Years down the road, they'll remember a scene from a film and they'll laugh or cry. That's what this is supposed to be about, isn't it? When people say they hate found footage, it's clear to see why they do. They think of this era, when the term had been worn thin and left beaten and bloodied in the gutter by people who were in it to take advantage of demographics, not to tell stories. Although it may seem that found footage has slowly waned from its prevalence, it's actually been adapting to the times. With the popularity of the internet, the invention of social media, and the instant connectedness of the world, the path to tricking an audience isn't necessarily through a film that advertises on TV, shows at your local theater, and features a minimum three companies' logos at the beginning next to director and writer credits. Nowadays, found footage has seeped into the mainstream by way of not advertising on the internet, but being on the internet. One of the earliest and most remembered examples being that of Slenderman. What started out as a creepy Photoshop job for a competition became a long-standing icon for internet horror, leading to several movies and documentaries of questionable quality, but most notably a YouTube horror series, ARG, called Marble Hornets, a series that utilized found footage techniques as well as expanded upon them. This may not be the first of its kind, but this is definitely the one that sticks out to me. Marble Hornets, created by Troy Wagner, is a ARG revolving around Slenderman. It would be spread across YouTube videos, a side channel, the comments sections on YouTube, the Something Awful forum, and Twitter. Tons of puzzles and cryptic stuff going on, leading the audience to band together in order to decipher and unwrap the story and its purpose. There are tons of creations out there like this. Local 58, Dad's Tapes, Daisy, and the Mandela Catalog. There's even more Slenderman ones like Dark Harvest. One that has recently broken into the mainstream took a few slightly related concepts and slammed them together rather seamlessly. Liminal spaces, claustrophobia, found footage, and specifically a nostalgic air of VHS scan lines and white noise. The Backrooms. This video and its natural off-putting atmosphere, pacing, and intrigue would blow up. And seemingly overnight, everyone in the horror sphere was discussing it and the possible implications of its style and what would be coming next. You can find tons of ARGs as well as short experimental films online that employ the use of found footage in order to ground the audience within the world that they create. But it doesn't just stop there. Found footage has even found its way into video games, most notable among them being Outlast, where you play as an investigative journalist crawling around a psychiatric hospital that's filled to the brim with naked patients. Scary. The game incorporates found footage in the form of the journalist's camera, which is crucial to being able to see in dimly lit areas. The green night vision look is reminiscent of the Silence of the Lambs mixed with Wreck. Overall, it's an effective use of the format, limited, and used specifically to heighten tension. Another game that mixes the found footage format into its gameplay is Resident Evil 7, having an introduction to the game where you play as a documentary crew as they walk through a dilapidated and disgustingly evil residence. Just a bit of found footage mixed within the normal gameplay fare, but enough to leave an impact. Other games with some found footage in the gameplay or presentation include Her Story, Silent Hill Shattered Memories, and even Five Nights at Freddy's. Just because you don't see found footage swarming the theaters anymore doesn't mean it's not still prevalent. Found footage has become a mixed medium format, branching away from its epistolary beginnings, film, and its boom with the digital era, and now it can be found many places. Films, TV, video games, social media, no matter the medium, the format stays true to its core, breaking down the fourth wall and inviting the audience inside. At the end of the day, it's hard not to look at the breadth of found footage and declare it just another gimmick, or fad, but it's the very few and far between that eclipse being just a gimmick, the ones whose directors sought to utilize found footage for its strengths while accepting and managing the complexities of its flaws that stick out and remind me of why I enjoy the style so much. Found footage has something that other genres don't have. It's not really a genre. So while you can say you're tired of the zombie outbreak films plaguing the cinema in the past 10 to 20 years, or how boorish the torture porn craze was, found footage is more of a chameleon. Every couple of years, a film can utilize the format to their advantage and blow people out of the water. What We Do in the Shadows and Creep from 2014, Be My Cat from 2015, One Cut of the Dead. These are amazing films that just so happen to be found footage. As far as films go, we may be in a lull right now, with very few recent found footage films even breaking into the niche group conversations, but that doesn't mean the format is going anywhere. I feel like found footage has only gotten better with time. 
Now that the found footage style isn't turning a massive profit in the box office, there are seemingly less attempts at the next paranormal activity or the next Blair Witch. You could also make a film with a cheap camera. You don't have to make it found footage because your camera has such a low quality and therefore would be less believable in a normal setting or scrutinized for its visual appearance. All of this meaning that when somebody chooses to make a found footage film now, they're intentionally making that decision for the sake of their story. The reason found footage films are still being made is because the filmmakers want to make them. Not for a high return on investment, not for cashing in on the fad, but because they want to. Because the stories that they want to tell benefit from being found footage.